start off with a little bit of a review. Where is all the water on Earth? Well, of course, the vast majority of it is in oceans, and the second largest reservoir is ice. Underground water, aquifers, is the third largest reservoir, with about 1.05% of all water on Earth underground. How long does a molecule of water stay in, in a reservoir? Well, on average, in the ocean, about 4,000 years. In a lake, about 10 years. In a river, about two weeks. In the atmosphere, a few days. Groundwater can be anywhere from two weeks to 10,000 years old. In the US in 2005, we used 410 billions of gallons of water a day. And here's the surprising part, perhaps, to some of you. Almost half of that goes to making electricity. About a third goes to irrigation, 5% to industry, 2% to aquaculture, like livestock, and etc. 2% to aquaculture, livestock, and mining, and 11% to the people. Let's look at what aquifers are. So here's a cross section from soil down into an aquifer. And uh, groundwater is, first of all, water that's found underground in the cracks and spaces in rocks and in soil. An aquifer is actually a rock or sediment from which groundwater can be extracted. So in this diagram, you, you see a picture of the unsaturated zone where there is water in the pore spaces, but it doesn't fill the pore spaces. And then you see the saturated zone where water fills the pore spaces. The line in between those, the demarcation, is called the groundwater table or the water table. Porosity is this amount of space or void within a rock. So the volume of the pore space divided by the total volume of the rock gives you the percent porosity. For example, in this particular case, three tennis balls has about 33% porosity. Porosity is always reported as a percent. Porosity is affected by the grain size. If there is a similar grain size, either big or small, porosity is, is equal and it's medium. But if there's a mixture of coarse and fine grains, then porosity actually can go down. You can start to fill up the pore space with little pieces of rock. Now, permeability is another very important thing. Permeability is the ease in which a fluid goes through a rock. So you can have a rock that's very porous. It has a lot of holes in it. But if the holes are not connected, the rock will not be permeable. The water won't pass through it. So there's other ways besides just grain size of making voids in rocks. One way is to fracture the rock, and so you can have crystalline rocks like granite that have aquifers in them. They're rare, but they can happen. And another possibility is you can start to dissolve the rock away, and that is very common in Texas especially, and in Florida, in a type of topography we call karst, where the limestone makes up the bedrock, and along cracks first, you start to dissolve the rock away and create larger pores. So we looked at water table a minute ago. The water table is the line below which the pores are all completely filled with water and the ground is in fact saturated. And that's an important concept to remember because the ground water table tells you a lot about the way the aquifer is going to behave. So here's a picture of a kind of exaggerated hillside and a river at the bottom and a lake at the top, which is a little strange. We probably need something draining that lake, but that's maybe on the other side. So notice a couple of important things. First of all, the, the shape of the water table kind of follows the shape of the topography. Not exactly, but a little bit. So the water table actually isn't flat. It rises up under higher ground and it sinks lower under lower ground. Also notice that the river is above the water table. So this river is being naturally fed by the groundwater. It's leaching into the river. 
And of course, the, it looks like the pond at the top is also leaching into the ground table, groundwater table and adding water to it. The lines, curved lines showing are showing you the flow lines of water through the water table. So just like anything else, water in the aquifer is going to flow downhill. So an unconfined aquifer is an aquifer like those two that are shown here that's open above and can easily gain or lose water from, from the surrounding rock or to the surrounding rock. In this case, you can see that rainwater comes through the soil and enters the groundwater. A, a large rainstorm would raise the water table. This diagram shows also a perched aquifer right here, and this aquifer is sitting on top of something that's labeled aquaclude. So what is an aquaclude? That's a new vocabulary word for you. Well, let's break it down. Aqua means water, and clude from the Latin meaning to close. So an aquaclude does not let water penetrate it. And so usually something like a muddy rock or a shale is an aquaclude. And in this case, the water that seeps down from above can't get deeper than that, so it sits up high. We call it a perched water table. Kind of handy when you're drilling your backyard well, unless it's a very small water table, in which case you might think you've hit the main water table and, in fact, only hit a tiny perched one and run out of water pretty quickly. But if it's a big enough one, then you drilled much less deep than you would otherwise have and saved a lot of money. A confined aquifer, on the other hand, is an aquifer that is under pressure, and that is because it is surrounded by aquacludes both above and below, and so the water in the aquifer builds up pressure. A confined aquifer, in this case, has a small area in the hills where it's open for recharge, but as the layers get deeper, the water becomes pressurized. It's the same kind of concept you use for siphoning. And you might, in fact, do a demonstration of this today, where the pressure at the top open surface of the line is, is the water table pressure, and that is where the water would like to rise to if it can. So if you drill a hole down into the water table, it is going to try to rise to the level of the open surface, which is right here. And that means that that well will flow, this one out of ground, this one not quite out of ground, it's, it flows higher than the water table itself, but not out into the uh, above ground. So both are artesian wells. They're wells where the water is under pressure and has risen higher than you drilled to get to the water, but one of them is actually flowing and the other one is not. So an artesian well is one that flows without having to pump it. This is a natural artesian well that is in, I think, France, if I remember correctly. And the water just flows out of this fountain all the time under natural pressure. This is also an artesian well, but it's an oil well. So artesian doesn't necessarily have to do with water. It has to do with the pressure. This happens to be one of the first artesian wells drilled in the Odessa area out in the Permian Basin. Now a spring is a place where water naturally flows out of the bedrock at, to the Earth's surface and it happens wherever the aquifer and the Earth's surface interact. It may be that in this case you've peeled away the cliff and so it's seeping out of the aquifer parallel to the cliff face. Um, that would be perhaps something like like this area, if you, if you were to dig in right there, water would flow out and you'd have a ni very nice spring. Um, of course, the creek itself can be a spring, as it sometimes is. One of the things that's really important to know about water and, and the water table is that you can alter it by pumping. So what one thing that often happens is this well in the middle is demonstrating. You start to pump a lot of water out and that will cause the water table to drop in the vicinity of the well. And so you have a lowered water table. And that means you might leave your neighbors high and dry above the water table, unable to get water from excess pumping. Because it pumps in all directions, you end up with a cone-shaped, this is only 
perpendicular one slice view. In two dimensions, the cone looks kind of like a V, but in three dimensions, it would look like a cone of depression around the well that's pumping so much water. Now, groundwater contamination is a really important problem because many, many communities use groundwater. And of course, if the water is moving, then so are contaminants. And so this is just a picture showing you the kinds of contaminants that might mm -hmm. move through the ground in the, in the aquifer. If you have an, a mine with waste, if you have fertilizer being produced, septic tanks, gas tanks that are underground sometimes leak. Um, so any of these kinds of things can cause uh, contamination in the groundwater, and that's problematic. There's some various kinds of things that you can do with it. Here's one example. You can um, have, you can allow the ground itself to purify the water. So here's a contaminated septic tank that's leaking and the contaminated water is spilling into the sandstone all around it. But in fact, aquifer rocks are pretty darn good filters. So by the time the water gets all the way to your drinking water well, it has been treated and, and cleaned out just by the natural process of passing through some fine, fine grain sediments. Your pool takes use, use of this. Have any, any of you used diatomaceous earth in your pool? That's essentially what it's doing. It's sucking up the contaminants and having it cling to the particles rather than get out of the, and get therefore out of the pool water. Salt water can be a contaminant in wells, and this is a particular problem, obviously, along shorelines, along the Texas coast and the Florida coast, and anywhere along the Gulf, in fact. Uh, you very commonly in the aquifer will have your freshwater aquifer, and then underneath it, you have salt water. Why underneath? Well, of course, salt water is more dense than freshwater, so it will stay underneath. So there's a line between the salt water and the freshwater, and much of the time that you're pumping fresh water out, you're fine, but if you pump too much, notice how this salt water surface is starting to come up. You might reach the point where you actually have salt water in your well, which is not what you want. And here's a position showing you salt water in the well at the cone of depression around the pumping and then the rising of the salt water boundary and therefore you have salty well water. You guys are going to look at some cases of saltwater intrusion and talk about why it might be happening in your aquifer lab.